Hello everyone, and so far we've seen some amazing projects on bug detection. So I'll be switching gears a bit and we'll talk about BIFET that helps decompilers, so, that helps decompilers handle decompilation uh, of Python binaries via transformation rules. This is a joint collaboration between University of Virginia, Georgia Tech, and University of Tennessee, Knoxville. So we can all agree that we all love using Python, right? I can see some C++ and Java folks staring at me right now for that, but just bear with me. Uh, so everybody is using Python because it's essentially easy. And we're slowly seeing a trend where more and more people are going towards Python. And as you can see from this figure, you can see that uh, along the years, uh, across different programming languages, Python is slowly climbing to the top. And when I say everyone is using Python, I do mean everyone. Malware writers are using Python to create high-profile malware programs. And these malware programs are not our everyday Python programs. They are compiled to bytecodes. And these bytecodes are quite similar to x86 binaries, so instead, uh, as you may expect, they are quite hard to analyze. The good news is we've got decompilers, and decompilers do get back the source code from that bytecode. Now, seems like problem solved, right? Well, unfortunately, these decompilers don't always work. They, in fact, fail on many binaries, many malware binaries. So we looked into that. And let me explain why is that. So when we looked at these decompilers, what we found out that it's actually easier to break them than to fix them. So why is that? Well, essentially, these decompilers are quite complex. They've got tons, uh, they've got a large code base, they've got tons of grammar parsing rules. So in order to debug them, you have to be an expert in them. But let's, let's assume we are all experts in decompilers, right? So what we saw is that if one is to create a patch right, for the error that was happening earlier, what we saw was side effects. So for this patch, what you would see is that another uh, source code, which was earlier passing, would now fail. Now on the other hand, we also, saw, we also see that there are multiple decompilers. Each of them are unique. They've got their strengths and weaknesses. And with that, they're also unique in terms of implementation. Like some are implemented in Python. The others are in C++. Some use grammar parsing rules. The other use code logic to decompile. But the idea is that if you want to debug or fix them, you have to go through all of them individually, which takes quite some effort, right? And it's not scalable. So instead, what you are going to ask is, what am I going to do? Well, what we do is we take a unique angle to this problem, and we attempt to fix the binary directly instead. Now, let me get into the detail of that. So to uh, fix it, we obviously need to understand what are the decompilation errors that we're dealing with. So we ran the experiment and found out that a typical decompilation error looks something like this, where you would get an error message. So uh, from that error message, we could get extra information, like the function name or the offset, where it approximately fails. So these errors are what we call explicit errors, because of their explicit error messages. Now, what you could ask is that why not just call them errors? Well, because there are implicit errors as well. So what we found out is that these decompilers are also failing silently without any error messages. These are terrible because uh, you wouldn't even notice whether there is an error, and decompiler would essentially show that nothing bad is happening. So let me show you this example. On the left side is the original source code program, and on the right is what you would get after compiling and decompiling it. What you would notice is that all of it is the exactly the same up until this point. So while there were no errors reported, what you would notice is the semantic differences by the addition of two else blocks. And what we found out is this is actually terrible, because now we are dealing with errors 
that are not even being reported, and it can actually impact the forensic anal ana analysis down the road. So what we did was we studied them. So we took up, uh, we did a control study, and we took up uh, 3,000 source code files from PyPy and other places. We compiled them and decompiled them, and then compared both of them. So for a perfect decompiler, we should expect both of them to be the same. Sure, there can be mechanical differences, but what we focus on is the semantic or the structural differences between them. So what we found out is something in this way. So on the left side is what we would feed a decompiler, and on the right is the implicit error that we would get. So what we found out was errors where some statements were being uh, coupled with in the wrong scope. We saw con blocks of code which were coupled with the wrong scope. Then we saw much subtle errors, where in this case, try except now has an else block. So else block is quite unique to Python for try except, where essentially else block is only going to execute when S1 throws, uh, will not execute when S1 throws an exception. But the idea is that the malware can exploit all of them. In fact, he can even use these types of implicit errors, which are much more aggressive. As you can see, on the left side, there were two loops. But now on the right, there's just one. The second while loop converts into an if condition. And what you would see additionally is like there is an additional else block as well within this implicit error. Now, this is quite interesting, but at the same time, quite unfortunate, because now malware writers can cu couple all of these implicit errors. There are more in our paper, but you can use all of them to write programs and essentially making us no longer trust any decompilers, right? So what we did was we wanted to detect them. So we used the implicit error patterns that we get by profiling multiple programs, and we detect them in this manner. So essentially, let's say we have a binary. We decompile it, but now there is no error, but we don't know if it has an implicit error or not. So what we do is we look for any existing implicit uh, error pattern. If we find an implicit error pattern, we mutate it with the correct code that we have, and then we recompile it. Now, the idea is that we compare this corrected binary with the original one, and if the original binary has the corrected code at the same offset, that means that the uh, original implicit error that we detected was indeed an implicit error. So by using this approach, we were able to detect more than 22,000 implicit errors across five decompilers. These are errors that were not before detected. So. Now, having, uh, after identifying, we can move on to fixing. So we essentially fix all of these binaries by applying transformation. Uh, but let me, and let me show you how exactly do we do that. We do all of that by using forensically equivalent transformation, or FETs. So what are they? FETs are an extension of semantically equivalent transformation, or SETs. Uh, the goal is to transform or relax semantics while preserving forensically meaningful information. But now why do we need FETs? Well, essentially, we could use semantically equivalent transformation, but what we saw was that at times, semantically equivalent transformation would not remove the error. So we had to relax the semantics, while, uh, but at the same time, we tried to preserve the foren uh, forensically meaningful information. Let me show you exactly what that looks like through this example. In this example, the error is at the return block inside the width block, uh, on the return statement inside the width block. A, forensically, uh, a semantically equivalent transformation looks something like this. What you would do is you would replace width block with its, count, uh, with its implementation using try, accept, and finally. However, what we found out is that after doing that, we still have the error on the return statement. And that is because the error is essentially return being in the try or with block. So what we do instead is we do forensically equivalent transformation, where we just essentially move the return statement outside the with block. And notice while we remove the return statement outside, we replace it with the FET underscore return variable. Which, uh, so we do two things here. We are able to resolve the error for one, and secondly, by using that variable, we are preserving the forensically meaningful information. 
So by using uh, these uh, foreign uh, FETs and certs, we create multiple transformation rules that tackle different uh, different uh, areas where the decompilers were having problems with. So we tried to shorten lengths of long con uh, long uh, conditionals. We tried to divide logical expressions. We tried to handle different uh, Python-specific uh, structures, like converting lambdas into regular functions or we try to make the consecutive control flows simpler. We have more detail about how we derive them and what exactly do each of these transformation rules do in our paper. But by using these rules, we are able to resolve all of the errors. But one thing we were seeing is that the binaries can be very large, and we can apply these rules all over the binary. But that's not really effective, right? So we wanted to optimize that. We, use, we optimize that by using an iterative approach of transformation. So how, what exactly do we do that? Is essentially we take the control flow graph of the program and start with the node where we detect or identify the error. So once we have that block, we apply any transformation rule that's possible. If they are not effective, what we do is we extend our target nodes by using the edges that are connected to that node. And then we repeat the process again. We apply the transformations. If they're effective, we terminate. If not, then we extend further. So we continue doing that up until either we find a point where the binary decompiles fine, or we, are, we explore the entire binary. So by using this approach, we actually f find that we were only iterating 33% of the nodes instead of the whole binary. Now next, we wanted to measure the impact that we were making. So we do that by uh, collaborating with uh, reverse, uh, reversing labs, and we got ourselves uh, more than 35,000 sam uh, malware samples. The first thing that we do, we decompile them and find 44.6% of them were failing. Next, what we, uh, interestingly, what we find is that mo uh, the uh, later Python versions were failing more proportionally, showing that the decompilers are actually struggling with the later Python versions. Overall, we apply our approach, and we were able to resolve all of these errors. We also saw binaries which used opcode remap or obfuscation. What essentially those are is that uh, op, uh, for opcode remap, binaries are binaries that are compiled using a customized uh, compiler. These are essentially used by uh, Dropbox who want to not reveal their code or prevent reverse engineering. So essentially, obviously, they're not decompilable. Then there are obfuscators like PJ Orion that uh, change the control flow of the binary so that they're obfuscated. Uh, in our paper, we give more details as to how we tackle them and how we make them decompilable. And we also show how our approach is more practical in terms of design. Overall, we were able to resolve more than 17,000 errors across five different decompilers. Uh, we were able to handle opcode remap and obfuscated binaries, all with just trans 30 transformation rules. Thank you. Well, questions for our speaker? So while we wait for their questions. Mm -hmm. From what you've seen, I think you've convinced me, but do you think it's possible to create a perfect Python decompiler? Uh, no, not really. So we actually want, we all actually started with that. We wanted to m try to make a perfect decompiler, but we saw a lot of issues. There is more detail in our paper, but originally there's a lot of dependencies between within these, comp de these decompilers, and that in itself actually produces more errors, in fact. And what our approach does is it essentially tries to disconnect that and tries to transform the binary beforehand. And it actually is much simpler and much practical approach in that sense. Wow, very cool. I mean, you, yeah, you stopped the reinventing the wheel problem yeah. I guess, <laughs> by leveraging their other things. And then I guess the ah, question, yes, please go ahead. Very high level question. So if you have, please go ahead. Okay, so uh, I was. Just wondering why Python, I think the first slide that you showed for motivation was a bit highly exaggerated. So yeah. I was wondering if you have a more scientific kind of justification for why Python, mm -hmm. and what was the source of that um, image that you showed? 
Oh. It's on growing exponentially? So, was it some scientific study or what was, where, where does it originate from? No, so the, the main motivation is that there are a lot of Python malware and they're going unnoticed. So they're being ignored and what we saw is that forensically these decompilers are also no, not working. So there's essentially a large gap in the community where nobody's working on this problem. So that's why we worked on it and that's how we got here. Okay, and what was the source of the image that you showed? Was there any scientific justification behind that? Oh, that that, that was just study? from Stack Overflow. Their, their stats, their yearly stats of how uh, the different programming languages are growing. Okay, okay thanks. Okay. Thank you for your great talk. Uh, yeah. I'm Hyungsuk from Georgia Tech. Uh, what is the big difference between the decompiling uh, some binaries and decompiling Python, do you think? I mean, they're the same. You're uplifting the code from a lower language to a higher language. So the general idea is the same. Now, exactly the impl uh, as for the implementation, how these decompilers are different from, uh, let's say, hex rays, that I'm not exactly sure because I haven't really worked with hex rays a lot. So I can't really comment on that. But the fundamentally, uh, Python decompilers are also using parsing rules. They are also, like, the, the implementations are also diverse. So they are also motivated by the traditional decompilers, or, or the, the Python decompilers. So you wouldn't see, like, the fundamental differences between the two. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, let's thank our speaker one more time. Oh, thank you.